everybody for today. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have gathered us together, that we may uh, study the words of the Christians that have gone long before us and have confessed the faith to an unbelieving world. We pray that you would grant us the same Holy Spirit so that we may confess the faith to an unbelieving world. We also ask that you would keep us safe from sickness in this time and that your holy will would be done in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, so we are on page 19 of the reader. We're ready for a dialogue with Trifo, uh, chapter 137. And this will be our last session of the Apologists, because we will today get through uh, this last chapter of Trifo, and then we want to look at the, a chapter from the Epistle to Diagnetus. And then we're on to a different topic. Oh. Yeah, it sneaks up on you, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize we were that close. Sneaks up on you. All right, so uh, this isn't a, well, I tell you what. Aaron, would you read that first paragraph uh, that ends at the bottom of page 19? Say no evil thing, my brothers, against him that was crucified, and treat not scornfully the stripes wherewith all may be healed, even as we are healed. For it will be well if persuaded by the scriptures you are circumcised from hard-heartedness, not that circumcision which you have from the tenants that are put into you, for that was given for a sign, and not for a work of righteousness, as the scripture com compel you to admit. Ascend therefore and pour no ridicule on the Son of God. Obey not the Pharisaic teachers, and scoff not at the king of Israel, as the rulers of your synagogues teach you to do after your prayers. For if he that touches those who are not pleasing to God is as one that touches the apple of God's eye, how much more so is he that touches his beloved? And that this is he has been sufficiently demonstrated. All right, thank you. So, what is his, now this is not the final chapter of the dialogue, but it's getting towards the end of it. And what's his final advice to Trifo and then the fellow Jews that are with him? Obey not the Pharisee teachers. Right, right. So just scoff yeah. at the king. Right. So first of all, yeah, don't scoff at the crucified one, which we've talked about before. How in the ancient culture, uh, you know, li living in a in a Christianized culture, everybody associates the cross and then the crucifixion then with Christianity, and it's lost a little bit of its um, oh kick as far as being a shameful, a shameful death. Um, so that we people, look at that as Christians in like honor and reverence. Right. But and, even, and I, even the even the pagans just say, okay, well, yeah, yeah, they Christians believe that Jesus was crucified at the end. Right now, in the ancient world, though, I mean, this was the most shameful death that you could die, and so it's it's one thing to follow the religion of a man who's died, but then to have died the death of a criminal so shameful as well. Then, so it's not just uh, you know the founder, so to speak, of your religion just you know died accidentally or something. Like this. No, he was tried, he was crucified of all things. He was he was given the, the slave's death, the worst criminal death, and you're following him then. So it's not like he was assassinated or something like that, and people have, have deified him. It's, it's this is the worst possible thing. So it's it would be very, very shameful. Easy. Yeah, very shameful. So it would be very easy for someone in the ancient world just to heap scorn upon Christians and upon Christ, especially because it's well, yeah, you died the death of the worst criminal, and you're following this guy. That's you know that's that's ridiculous. So that's where that religion is. I like from. that it says treat not scornfully the stripes wherewith all may be healed. Right, right. So they're, that, that's, that's a good point. So they're mocking not only the fact that he's been crucified, but if you're mocking his wounds, those are the very wounds and stripes by which we're healed, by which the forgiveness of sins is earned, by which um, he makes atonement for the sins of the world. So, uh, right. So, so at that point, it's, it's not just that you're mocking God, which is bad enough, but you're, you're mocking the means of salvation. You're, mo you're mocking the instrument by which God brought salvation into the world. Good point. I misunderstood your question. I oh, thought, go ahead. I thought you asked what was the last thing. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> the first thing. Oh. 
<laughs> well, that's fine. That's fine. Well, because in fact, we we can kind of have a bookend here. So okay. it's at first, don't mock and scorn yeah, him mock. and his and his death, and then at the end of this chapter or at the end of this paragraph, don't buy into the Pharisaical doctrine. So those two things actually, I, I see what you meant though, because those two things go together. Because what were the Pharisees doing at the crucifixion? <laughs> Probably mocking and scorning, you know, celebrating. Right. Right. Exactly right. I mean, they used they chose Barabbas instead of letting Christ go. Right. We would actually have a actually have we would rather have a actual robber, murderer, insurrectionist right. than this man. Right. Right. In fact, that'll be uh, this morning in uh, Matthews. That's what we'll hear the gospel lesson for today from Mark 15. Um, you know, and every, you know the soldiers are mocking him. The chief priests and scribes are mocking him and reviling him. Uh, in Mark's gospel, um, the two malefactors that he's hung between are reviling him. Uh, people are wagging their heads at him as they walk by, and you know, mocking him with all sorts of you know, he saved others himself; he cannot save this sort of thing. Right. So the, the Pharisaical doctrine in the New Testament is to deny that he's the Son of God and to mock and deride him. And so these two, you know, the, the paragraph begins and ends with that same idea. He's just telling Trifo and his Jewish companions, you know, don't lapse into that pharisaical doctrine where you're mocking and deriding you know, God himself and the means of your salvation. Now, sandwiched in between those two bookends, then, is something that is uh, excellent for the topic of justification by faith in the writings of Justin here. So the second full sentence. For, if, uh, for it will be well if, persuaded by the scriptures, you are circumcised, circumcised from hard-heartedness. Not that circumcision which you have from the tenets that are put into you. That means from the law, from Moses. Uh, for that was given for a sign, not for a work of righteousness, as the scriptures compel you to admit. So, we go back to, I believe what we were talking about last week or the week before, that there are two kinds of circumcision. There's the physical circumcision that God gave to Abraham and then confirmed in Moses, uh, Genesis 17, um, which is the physical circumcision of the, of the foreskin. But then we also then looked at passages last week as far as when the prophets and Moses himself say, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Well, it, that's obviously a spiritual one because the heart doesn't have foreskin and you can't actually do that, etc. Uh, so it was put off your sin, and it, it, it was repentance and faith, which is the circumcision of the heart. Uh, putting off the sins of your flesh, suppressing the sins of your flesh, and believing in the promises of well, God. Then that circumcised from hard heartedness, mm -hmm. does that mean what you just said, mm -hmm. that you strengthen your heart, make it hard and be able to... Well, generally, when we think of hard heartedness, what do, what do we think of? Stubborn. Stubborn, right. Yeah, Pharaoh was hard-hearted. Yeah. Uh, you know, he tells, you know, in those passages we looked at last time from Deuteronomy, uh, you know, you're a stiff-necked people, you have hardened hearts. Yeah, so uh, we still talk about this the, in our language today. It's still the same. If someone has a hard heart, uh, then they're not open to something. They're, they're right. stubborn, they're recalcitrant, they're obdurate, they're rejecting. Uh, As opposed to soft heart. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you're, yeah, that's a good point. If you're soft-hearted, yeah. then you're, you're tender. You're accepting. You're compliant. You know, these sorts of things. Uh, so right. It's, so you have by nature a hard heart. You're not. You know. You're you're set against God's word, against God's commandments, uh, against the things that God gives. Don't have that kind of heart. Uh, but circumcise the foreskin of your heart, so you have a soft heart, uh, so that you're accepting of the word, so that you're repenting of the sins of the flesh, putting off the sinful flesh. Uh, believing God's promises, accepting his good things, humbling yourself before him, things of that nature. Right, so, uh, that you be circumcised from hard-heartedness, so that you put hard-heartedness away and be believing. Not that circumcision you have which the tenants put into you, uh, for that was given for a sign. Let's open our Bibles to Romans 4. We'll go to Romans 4.11. And he received 
the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Okay, so Paul is the one who calls circumcision a sign of or a seal, a sign or seal of the righteousness of faith, uh, which means, and then he goes on to say, the righteousness of faith he had already before circumcision. Mm -hmm. So Paul's entire point in this part is that righteousness did not come from works of the law, from works of righteousness, but rather it came from faith, and then circumcision was given as a sign of that. So it, it was a visible sign, this person is righteous by faith. And so Justin is appropriating that Pauline language, again, like we said before, without quoting Paul, because you know, Trifo wouldn't care. For Trifo's point of view, Paul was an apostate Jew. But you have the same idea going on here, that it's, here, that it's given uh, as a sign or as a seal, not for a work of righteousness. Now, this connects back to, if, you, uh, if we go back a couple pages to Dialogue 23, chapter 23, um, on page 17, We see that he uses a similar phrase um, about in the middle there. Let's see. For when Abraham himself was in uncircumcision, he was justified and blessed by reason of the faith which he reposed in God, as Scripture tells. Moreover, the Scriptures and the facts themselves compel us to admit that he received circumcision for a sign, not for righteousness. Um, and then if we go down a few more lines... And furthermore, the inability of the female sex to receive fleshly circumcision proves that this circumcision has been given for a sign, not for a work of righteousness. So this phrase here in, in 23, work of righteousness, is not, is not the exact same phrase as in 137, but it's real close. And so they're synonymous, uh, this idea that the Jews are viewing circumcision as a work of righteousness, as a righteous work, a work by which you earn righteousness. And Justin is continually throughout the dialogue saying, no, that's not the case. This is a sign of the righteousness of faith. It's a seal of the righteousness of faith. Uh, so if we go back to 137, then we see that the idea of the work of righteousness, again, those two phrases, although different in Greek, are, are I think, clearly synonymous. I think that's the first time I've ever seen where they talk about the woman's ability that she is... Um, Oh, unable to, yeah, yes, to receive certain yeah. But she has the ability to observe. And so, therefore, it's not done by um, a work of righteousness. Right. But she still... But she's still righteous. I guess her heart is circumcised. Exactly. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And so this is where, you know, that's a big argument because people always ask, uh, you know, well... Women couldn't be circumcised, so what does that mean? Are they within the covenant? And it was always, well, sure, yeah, absolutely they are. Because you know, it's not a, you know, that's not the work of righteousness by which you earn righteousness. Because then only men could be righteous in Old Testament Israel. This was simply a sign of the righteousness to come. That would be in Christ. Now then, in Christ, then, since baptism replaces circumcision, are women baptized? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Right. So again, you have the idea of what we've seen all throughout the, the Old Testament with the New Testament is there's the Old Testament type, which is a shadow of something to come, a reality to come in Christ, and the type is always you know, incomplete, uh, whereas the, the, uh, the antitype, I'm sorry, the, uh, the type is incomplete, where the antitype, the fulfillment of it, is always complete. So you know, King David is a type of Christ. Is he a perfect example of the Messiah? No, no, you're right. No. Yeah, not, not by any means. Exactly, right. But then you have the Christ come along, and is he a perfect example of the Christ? Absolutely. Circumcision is incomplete in that it can't be applied to, you know, 50, 51% of the population. Baptism comes along in the New Testament, which can be applied to 100% of the population. Baptize all nations, etc. All creatures, Mark 16, 15. Yeah, both both genders and uh, all ages. Right. Well, yeah, and that would be another point of comparison because you could circumcise all ages. I mean, Abraham was circumcised when he was 90, 95, something like that. 
In the book of Acts, Paul had Timothy as a young man circumcised. Um, you know, in the apocryphal uh, book of Judith, uh, one of the traitors from the Assyrian armies um, to the Israelites is circumcised as a you know, middle-aged man. So it's, it's not unheard of by any means. Uh, but yeah, that would be a positive point of comparison between the two. Okay, let's uh, flip the page then. Page 20. <clears throat> and as they kept silence, I continued. So this is still Justin speaking. My friends, I now refer to the scriptures as the 70 have interpreted them. What do we mean? When, what does he mean when he says as the 70 have interpreted them? This would be... This would be the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So this would be the Bible that uh, the uh, dispersion Jews were using at the time, because everyone spoke Greek in the ancient world. Uh, it was what English is to our world today. So that's what he means when he says the 70, and it'll come up again here in a moment. Uh, for when I quoted them formerly as you possess them, I made proof of you to ascertain how you were disposed. For mentioning the scripture which says, Woe unto them, for they have devised evil counsel against themselves, saying, as the seventy have translated, I continued, Let us take away the righteous, for he is distasteful to us. Whereas at the commencement of the discussion I added, what your version has, Let us bind the righteous, for, it, for he is distasteful to us. But you have been busy with about some other matter, and seem to have listened to the words without attending to them. But now, since the day is drawing to a close, for the sun is about to set, I shall add one remark to what I have said and conclude. I have indeed made the very same remark already, but I think it would be right to bestow some consideration on it again. No, you're fine. That's all right. <laughs> I'm just amazed that he can fit an entire rotary phone into his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do that? So now, at this point, then, he's, he's paving the way, then, for his final speech. Uh, he'll end the book, he'll end the dialogue with a final, uh, a, a final plea for Trypho's conversion. And then the book ends. It says that they departed peaceably. Uh, so this was not just some sort of a polemic against the Jews where, uh, you know, it, it's not like another apologetic work that we have where... Uh, it's a dialogue between a Christian and a pagan, and at the end, the pagan ends up uh, converting. It's not like that, uh, but just the two, the two part ways, but they do so peaceably and, and in a friendly way. And so that in and of itself is helpful to show that at least within part of the early church, it wasn't just the, uh, the, the vitriol and the, um, uh, just the uh, you know, separation of the Jews, but rather at least in Justin's area in Rome, because you had a big Jewish population, there was dialogue going on between them. And as we've mentioned in previous sessions, that dialogue continued over the centuries, um, sometimes to a greater extent, more, um, more harsher, and sometimes to a lesser extent in its harshness. Uh, but for in this section, then, he, he's quoting the Old Testament, uh, you know, reminding them of what the Old Testament scriptures, which they themselves hold, what that says said is, you know, basically, don't do this to yourself. Uh, you know, don't, I mean, you've taken away the righteous for he is distasteful to us. Uh, you know, don't walk away in unbelief. So this is the beginning of his final plea, where he's going to say, don't be unbelieving like your ancestors were unbelieving, but be believing. Again, if we go back to the very beginning of this chapter, in the Son of God and the ones that, uh, the stripes and wounds. Is everything okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Being called in, you are an essential employee. Yes. There you go. The, um, what was it? You had some kind of certificate. That, didn't you tell me that Cecil Atkinson had? Oh, they got to give you some sort of paperwork. So if you get, yeah. yeah. So you can get yeah, past yeah. Checkpoint Charlie and all right. that. Right. Apparently, this. Not all dealerships are considered uh, a, a critical or important. Mm -hmm. uh, they can stay open. I see. Cecil is one of them. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'll just have to 
You drop the gear off. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so we get up in the middle of church. I understand. No, nope, I understand. I understand. Duty calls. Duty calls. You were going to say something. Oh, no? Okay. So if there are no more questions, that ends our study of Justin's dialogue with Trifo. Now, there's a whole lot more going on in the, in the dialogue, but this is just a quick spattering of the righteousness of faith, especially against the Jews as far as we're not saved by our works. Now, the reason that we wanted to end with this next one then, the epistle to the Diognetus chapter 9, is because this is where uh, the epistle to Diognetus, especially this chapter, is the, the pinnacle of uh, justification for Christ's sake by faith in, um, in the second century apologists. Uh, sometimes the epistle to Diognetus isn't. Uh, it's, it's viewed as one of the apostolic fathers rather than one of the second century apologists. Uh, for the most part, it's, it, it doesn't matter because there's some overlap between the two. Uh, but this is, this is the clearest expression of the gospel in the second century, and especially by faith alone. So, would somebody be so kind to read the first paragraph of chapter 9? As long then as the former time endured, he permitted us to be born along by unruly impulses, being drawn away by the desire of pleasure and various lusts. This was not that he at all delighted in our sins, but that, but that he simply endured them nor that he approved the time of working iniquity, which then was, but that he sought to form a mind conscious of righteousness, so that being convinced in that time of our unworthiness of attaining life through our own works, it should now, through the kindness of God, be vouchsafed to us, and having made it manifest that in ourselves we were unable to enter into the kingdom of God, come to a knowledge of Christ, mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. And, and salvation through Christ. Yeah, 2 Peter 3, 9, God's not slack concerning his promises, as some consider slackness, but he wills that all men repent. No, that's an interesting idea. So, yeah, the, It's not necessarily cyclical, but it's just, it's that same right. idea over and over through Well, time. no, but that's, there, there's something to that. I mean, time, from a Christian point of view, time is linear. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. The end, you know. Uh, whereas in pagan thought, I mean, actual pagan thought, it's time is cyclical, and, and just never ends. And you have these different cycles. But we see that even within, that they can both be true. The overall scheme is linear, beginning and end. But within that, you have, even just look at the seasons. You know, the trees are budding again. You have the cycle of the seasons. And it's true even with cultures. And that's a great point, though. Yeah, because we're definitely in this time now where, you know, iniquity is clearly on the rise, which is the whole point of why we've been studying the second century apologists. How did they interact with a... You know, in their case, a pre-Christian culture, and you know what, what were they accused of, and how did they answer those things? Uh, but we have the same thing. It's we live in a post-Constantinian culture, uh, not quite a post-Christian culture, but yeah, it's people are. You know, it's a time of iniquity, and they're relying upon their works, and so uh, let's keep going here because we've got about fifteen minutes, and I want to get through this here. Second paragraph. But when our wickedness had reached its height. And it had been clearly shown that its reward, punishment and death, was impending over us. And when the time had come which God had beforehand appointed for manifesting his own kindness and power, how the, love, how the one love of God, through exceeding regard for men, did not regard us with hatred, nor thrust us away, nor remember our iniquities against us, but showed great long-suffering and bore with us. He himself took on the burden of our iniquities. He gave his own son as a ransom for us, the Holy One for transgressions, the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the incorruptible one for the corruptible, the immortal one for them that are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? By what other one was it possible so that we, the wicked and ungodly, could be justified than by the only Son of God. O sweet exchange, O unsearchable operation, O benefits surpassing all expectations, that the wickedness of many should be hid in, the single, in a single righteous one, and that the righteousness of one should justify many transgressors. So what's the cause of this time and season of righteousness? It's been, you know, God has been 
patient and enduring with sin for so long. And then at the very beginning of this paragraph, what is, what is, what? The wickedness has reached its height. Yeah, yeah, wickedness has reached its height. And so it was clearly shown that its reward, punishment, and death was impending over us. And then, and when the time had come which God had before appointed for manifesting his kindness and power. So this is very similar to Galatians 4, uh, when he says, you know, at, at the... Um, at the appointed time, at, the proper time. Yeah, the appointed time. So God from eternity knew, I mean, he, he foreknew and then planned Christ. So Christ is plan A. He wasn't a plan B, like a whoops, and, and he messed up. Therefore, now we'll do this instead. But he was plan A, and uh, it's a matter of, it's a matter of, you know, Diognetus, you think that this has happened you know, late in time, but in reality it's happened at the appointed time. It's happened uh, when the time had come which God before had appointed for manifesting his kindness and his power. So it's, so you have, first of all, the whole scheme of, you know, those linear you know, time of iniquity to now a time of righteousness, a season of righteousness. But you also have then, this has all been planned out beforehand for eternity. Now, the second part of this is again wonderful because this, this is the clearest uh, teaching of the vicarious atonement, of, of Christ as our substitute uh, in, in the entire second century. So, he himself took on him the burden of our iniquities. Sounds an awful lot like Isaiah 53. Uh, he gave his own son as a ransom for us, the Holy One for transgressors. Now, here's what's interesting. If we were to look at this in, in the Greek text of it, the word for there is actually he pair, which in this, uh, not like he pair, like a male pair. Um, <laughs> Which means, not just, it can mean for, but in this case, it's Greek, that's why you can't. <laughs> uh, but in this, in this instance, uh, used in this way, it means in behalf of, or on behalf of someone. So this is where we get the idea, you know, the, the language in and of itself shows us the idea of this vicarious atonement. The Son of God dying for the sins of mankind. We even still speak like that. But the... the the preposition that he uses there is even more forceful than that. The, so, so replace that. The Holy One on behalf of the transgressors. The blameless one on behalf of the wicked. The righteous one on behalf of the unrighteous. The incorruptible one on behalf of the corruptible. The immortal one on behalf of them that are mortal. So you have all of these things that he is and that we are. And it's this one, you know, he, the sinless one on behalf of the sinner. So you have this idea of Christ is our substitute. Uh, you know, the Holy One is the substitute for transgressors, blameless for the wicked, uh, unrighteous, in, uh, the corruptible, and the mortal. So everything that he is, we are not, and that's why he's our substitute then in the suffering as he's taking up the burden of our iniquities. And then here, after that, uh, final, after that final question, or after the whole uh, immortal one on behalf of for them that are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? So, what's, according to the epistle to Diognetus, what's the only way to cover sins? Not works. No. Right, so it's not by works. In fact, we were supposed to have learned during the time of iniquity that it's not, that, we're, that we cannot... We are not deemed worthy for the kingdom of God by works. So, what deems us worthy then? The righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ. Now, if we go back, I don't have it in front of me. I left the book at home. If we go back and we look at, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, I don't have it on here, apparently. I thought I had it in my notes somewhere. Um, There, there's uh, once in chapter 8 where he specifically talks about how this, all this is, uh, and we don't have Diognetus chapter 8 in our reader, uh, but there's once towards the end of chapter 8 of the epistle to Diognetus where he talks about uh, how God reveals himself uh, through faith. So you have the idea of uh, the idea that we 
then have this all by faith. And then chapter 10, verse 1 begins with a statement that, again, wouldn't read necessarily like we would read it, or we, like we would have it written as confessional Lutherans, but you have the idea of, in the chapter before it and the chapter immediately following this, the idea that faith is what apprehends all this. Uh, so, yeah, so the thing that, that is able to deem us worthy, or by which God considers us worthy, isn't our works, uh, but is the righteousness that Christ uh, earns for us. I but, like that acronym for grace, God's reward at Christ's expense. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what saves us. Mm -hmm. Not the works. We can't do it ourselves. Right. It's only through God that we can be saved. Absolutely. E exactly. Right. Right. God's grace moves him to send his only begotten son into the world to do precisely what this anonymous disciple has written here. To take our place in death, hell, destruction, condemnation, so that we can have, you know, so that he can lift the burden of our iniquity. So that he can, like he said at the end of uh, the, the first paragraph there, uh, that we might, through the power of God, be considered worthy or deemed worthy. So there's nothing about works in there. Even There's nothing even about a combination of faith plus works. Just like there was in Justin. There's not, you know, it's not like faith plus circumcision. It's just simply, you're deemed worthy, you're considered worthy solely by the power of God, which is exhibited in Christ taking upon our sins. By what other one was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly, could be justified than by the only Son of God? O oh, sweet exchange. So that phrase right there then summarizes everything that he said. The righteous for the unrighteous, the... Uh, the um, uh, the mortal or the immortal for the mortal, the incorruptible for the corruptible, etc. So it's that idea of you know, the great exchange. Christ takes what's ours, and uh, so he takes all of our sin, and then we get to receive all of his righteousness, purity, innocence, blessedness, etc. Oh, unsearchable operation, O oh, benefits surpassing all expectation, that the wickedness of many should be hidden, a single righteous one, and the righteousness of one should justify many transgressors. So again, mimicking the language of Isaiah 53, um, that this is, then, the work of Christ. Mary, would you read that final paragraph for us? Having therefore convinced us in the former time that our nature was unable to attain to life, and having now revealed the Savior who is able to save even those things which it was formerly impossible to save, by both these facts, he desired to lead us to trust in his kindness, to esteem him our nourisher, father, teacher, counselor, healer. We might through the power of God be made, God be made able. Okay, so, just a little bit of background and reminder, the apologists are dealing with three big claims from the pagans. Cannibalism, because of their misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper. Incest, because of the misunderstanding of the terms brother and sister in Christ. Um, and then atheism, the belief that the Christians aren't worshipping any god, or rather they're worshipping false gods because they're not worshipping the Roman pantheon. They're not, they're not giving the emperors to do all of this. Diognetus, or the epistle to Diognetus, we don't know who wrote it, uh, but the official title is A Disciple to Diognetus. So... Uh, and there's even question about who Diognetus is. He may have been the Emperor Hadrian, based on some things that Marcus Aurelius writes in the introduction to his um, meditations. So we're not dealing with uh, Epistle of Diognetus, but these we're dealing with the, this atheism, especially this question, which is, um, you know, if, if this is the original religion, or if this is the true God, uh, you know, why so late in history? Meaning, if, if this is true, if Christians are worshiping the true God, then why did this God just show up on the scenes in the last 100 years, 150 years, depending on when it was written? Well, the Old Testament talks of him. Right, right. So, so you have that. Coming. Exactly, yeah. So you have, so you have the OT, and the OT prophecy about that. And the Old Testament starts as in the beginning. Right, and so we go back to some of um, uh, Justin's arguments, but also some of the other apologists' arguments that uh, the patriarchs were justified by faith, 
not by Sabbath, circumcision, dietary laws, those sorts of things. Uh, I mean, the apologist's basic argument is, as far as history goes, is the patriarchs were Christians, and then came Judaism, and now, you know, so, so now we're back to this. They were looking forward to the promised Messiah. The Jews should have been, but didn't put their faith in their works, and now we're back to this. Well... I don't see how we can answer that. Why so late in history? And that's God's will. Well, it is God, right. It's God's will. And but the, the disciple who writes this then is going to give us he endured a really them. interesting answer. He yeah, endured, he endured them. them. He permitted us to be born along by unruly impulses, etc. Uh, let's see. So, so, so what he's saying is it was because of God's patience and his forbearance that he waited this long. This was not that he delighted at all in our sins, but that he simply endured them nor that he approved of the time of working iniquity, which was, but that he sought to form a mind conscious of righteousness, so that being convinced in that time of our unworthiness of attaining life through our works, it should now, through the kindness of God, be vouchsafed to us. Okay, so this is where this older translation falters a bit. Um, this older translation uh, has there a, he, he sought to form a mind conscious of righteousness. Uh, it's better translated as, he was creating the present season of righteousness. And, and that then makes a whole lot more sense with what he said, um, nor that he approved the time of working iniquity. So the question of why so late in history is that God's been patiently forbearing with men's sins. So you have, you have two seasons. You have, you have the time of iniquity over here. And now, because Christ has come, what do we have? We have a time or a season of righteousness. Right. Yeah. Right. And then he goes on for the purpose then, so that being convi convinced that in the time of our unworthiness of attaining life through our own works, meaning that the goal of this was to show us that we can't do it through works. So this is very similar to Paul's argument in Galatians 3 about, you know, what's the purpose of the law in the Old Testament? Uh, if it's not to gain righteousness, then it's the pedagogue, it's the teacher, it's the, it's the schoolmaster to bring us to the knowledge of... Our sins. Exactly, yeah, to show us our sins, right. So that was the point of this time of iniquity, or this season of iniquity. Uh, so we can't attain it by our own works. It should now, through the kindness of God, be vouchsafed to us, and having made it manifest that in ourselves, we're unable to enter the kingdom of God. And so, so yeah, you can't enter the kingdom of God through works. That's what the time of iniquity was supposed to have taught. Uh, we might, through the power of God, be made able. Now, that, that word there, made able, again, this is where the older translation is okay, but could, it, it's better translated as uh, that by the power of God be uh, deemed worthy or considered worthy. So that's not that's not the word for you know justified. But if it's not by our works, we're not deemed worthy or we're not made worthy by our works. It's we are we are deemed worthy or we're considered worthy. So it's very close to the idea of you know, God doesn't you know that we can't be made righteous like Rome teaches, but that we are simply considered righteous, deemed righteous, declared righteous. As was, as was Abraham. Exactly, right, as was Abraham. Yeah, yeah, so we're putting the pieces together, and we see this theme running through them all. Uh, exactly, right, right. So, so that translation there, that, we, uh, that through the power of God we may be, we may be considered worthy, uh, I think even the newest translation, the Michael Holmes translation, I think, which is by far the best one, uh, translates it as made able. Or, or, or made righteous, something like that. Um, um, whereas, or, or no, is is made worthy, uh, but really the, the verb should be a, a deemed worthy. So this is the entire point. That this is the answer to the question that Diognetus was wondering. Uh, well, if Christianity is the religion, why is it so late in time? So you have the Old Testament prophecy, absolutely true. Uh, you have uh, you know the the idea of the patriarchs are justified by faith. The Jews are justified by faith, but they lost, they, they kind of lost focus and uh, 
thought they were righteous by their works. And then you have Christ then coming, the promise to Adam and Eve, the promise to Abraham, the promise to the patriarchs, etc. And as they walked in faith, now Christians walk in faith without the works of the law. Because the works of the law were to prepare a people for Christ, to separate them from the world for the sake of the coming of Christ, to teach them, again, you know, that you can't do it by works. This sort of thing. All this grace of God. Right, right. I think I've mentioned before, there was that book years ago, um, and I forget his name, he, he's an editor for Esquire, uh, but it's called A Year of Living Biblically, A.J. Somebody. Oh. Uh, yeah, the book is hilarious, because, yeah, yeah he, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's culturally Jewish. Um, and, uh, what's that? A.J. Hoy. No, no, that doesn't sound right. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, that goes the AJ. I did. I'm sorry. Huh. As, I, as I tell somebody else on Sunday morning, that's one. <laughs> okay. Hey. Since, since, since John's not here, now you get his. <laughs> All right. Um, but no, he, he says, I'm going to try, I'm going to spend a year reading through the Old and New Testament, and I'm going to try to do every single law that's in there. Oh. <laughs> and so three quarters of the year he spends with the Old Testament law, and he gets into some weird stuff. Yeah, you told us what his wife did. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you can't, yeah, don't, don't sit on anything that, you know, a menstruating woman has, you know, sat upon. And so uh, at that point, his wife got so mad at him that she went and, you know, sat on every chair in the house. So he had to go sit in the corner for a week, for a week. <laughs> No, but for the Feast of Booths, he built a little hut up on the apartment complex oh. roof and stayed there for, you know, a little period of time and uh, did the dietary restrictions and all that. Oh, and the stoning of the adulterer? He tried, yeah, he had to go stone an adulterer, so he walked in the park and asked a man if he was an adulterer, and the man was like, well, yeah. Uh, so he couldn't actually throw a rock at him, <laughs> so he took a pebble and walked up behind him, he's walking on, just kind of tossed it in his shoe. And, I mean, just things like that. Yeah, it was, it, 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 it's comical, but it was... Um, and his section, on the, his section the, the last quarter of the year where he's talking about the New Testament was, was just as bad because he can even miss the point. But uh, he gets to the end of the book, you know, spoiler alert, and he gets it halfway right. He's like, oh, I tried to live according to the laws of the Bible for a year, and I realized it can't be done. You know, at that point, I'm reading the book, and I'm like, oh, this has been a good read. I'm like, yes, you got it. And then yeah. in the next sentence, it's, so I guess what the real takeaway is, just do whatever you can. Yeah, that's, that's you know, typical human nature. But so that's the wrong, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's what simple humanity does with the time of iniquity. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, well, it just means we, we can't do it, but God just wants us to do our best and that sort of thing. Yeah, the book's hilarious. Um, I would highly recommend reading it if you want a good laugh. And uh, I mean, in the New Testament section, he goes to some um, snake handling church in Appalachia. I mean, of course, he has to pick the craziest like most sectarian Christians there are, um, those sorts of things. So, and, and he's an evolutionist, so he goes to some creation science museum, and you know, it, it, it's worth a read if you want a good laugh. So, but yeah, at the end, the moral of the story is that's sinful human nature. Yeah, you, you can't do it, but just just do whatever you can. It oh, seems so. to me this like timeline thing. It's it's almost cyclical, like. You know, you're you've got this conversation happening way back what 150 mm -hmm. A.D. Yep. And then we kind of have that happening uh, during the Reformation time. Yeah. You're like, oh, can we be saved by the works? And Luther tries it and realizes, no, it can't be done. Can't be done, right? Right. And I almost feel like our, we're kind of like back in that. You know, why doesn't the Lord just come back? Because he's he's being patient mm -hmm. and enduring so that people can... Our wisdom, light, honor, glory, power, and life so that we should not be anxious concerning clothing and food. And I would add eternal life. And eternal life, right, right, right. Well, right, so he deals with that part first, though. Uh, having therefore convinced us in the former time mm -hmm. that our nature was unable to attain life. So... He, he doesn't say eternal life there, but it's clear he's talking about eternal life because he's been talking about this righteousness that, that Christ has earned in our stead. So absolutely, right. So it's not, so that's the entire point of chapter 9 is it's not by works, it's 
only by the righteousness of Christ. Now, we get a little bit of that then uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the third line there. By both these facts, he desired to lead us to what? Trust. Trust in his kindness. And his kindness is what then? Now, if you go back up to the second paragraph, third line, uh, which God had before appointed for manifesting what? His own kindness. His own kindness and power. And if you go back up to the very last line of the uh, first paragraph, that we might through the power of God be made able or be deemed worthy. So you have this connection. That's the golden thread then running through these three paragraphs of this chapter of uh, Diognetus then, is that you have, we are, it's only by God's power. Christ is then the manifestation of God's kindness and power, which to deem us worthy, uh, to consider us worthy in everlasting life. And then here you have, he wants us to trust his kindness, meaning trust the, the grace of God which has sent Christ. Exactly, right. Because faith is belief, it's trust, etc. So here you have then, you know, that con another connection to, you have the atonement and you have trust in his kindness. The atonement is the manifestation of his kindness. And then he wants us to trust in his. See, that atonement. seems so easy for me to believe, and I don't understand why it's so hard for other people to accept that. Mm -hmm. It's so simple. Yep. I can't do it myself. You're right. Only God can do it. Right. Why right. is that so hard to You're fine. understand? <laughs> well, don't go that way. Don't go that way. They don't mind. Everybody on the internet can see the top of your head. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. And it's such a beautiful head. It, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> One question. Yes, ma'am. They had all those gods, Romans and Greeks. Mm -hmm. Did they have any god that gave them eternal life? That's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. And frankly, I don't know the answer, to be honest. Um, I mean, all it, it their depends. gods seem, give me something. Right. Give me wealth, you know, mm -hmm. give me health, you know, do this, do right. that. Give us peace, give us harmony, give us... Right. Right, it, it's, a, it's, it's mostly focused upon this life. You did have, um, I think you had that in the ancient world. Uh, I think you probably had that more so in the mystery cults. Not necessarily in the, uh, not necessarily in the state cult. Emperor and the pantheon of gods you know, around him, or rather... Uh, not subordinate to the emperor, but vice versa. Uh, that's a good question. That's really, you know, I'll be honest, I, I don't know the best way to answer that off the top of my head. Well, I was just curious because we got so many. Right. And well, and you know, I mean, you think about the myths, and you did have uh, you did have people, you know, going down to the uh, to Sheol or down down to Hades and whatnot. Um, you know, place of darkness and whatnot, and you know, gods rescuing other gods from Hades and. Mount Olympus, at least for the Greeks. So I think there was some concept of afterlife, but I, I haven't studied that a whole lot. So I'll have to I'll put that on the I'll put it in the queue as I tell my ATP folks, <laughs> okay. which means I'll get to it in about ten years. Yeah. No. Okay. So any other final questions, comments about the second century apologists? It's been I a good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been enjoyable for me too. It's been neat to see um, just how you know their the things that they were fighting against, the charges that were levied against Christians, aren't necessarily apples to apples today, but they are very similar. There, there are some that are apples to apples. Um, you know, nobody's accusing us of cannibalism or incest, um, or or atheism because atheism now means something different than it did in, in ancient Rome. But some of those ideas, you still have a bunch of misunderstanding about the faith. You know, and the sectarian churches don't help that sort of thing out. Uh, but you, you, we are beginning to see more. I just saw an article, there was a New York Times op-ed in the last week that basically blamed Christians for the coronavirus I stuff. Know, I saw. And, and, and the first thing I thought of, remember when we read that to think, uh, it was in chapter 40 from Tertullian's Apology? He said, you know, he's like, oh, you know, the, the, the Nile dries up. You know, the Nile doesn't give us water. And they, you know, away with the Christians, or, you know, the, the, the Tiber uh, rises up to the walls of Rome. Ah, blame the Christians, or, you know, there's famine and pestilence. You know, away with the Christians to the lion. Well, nothing new. It, exactly, right. And you see this, and you're like, oh, it's you know, because evangelicals voted for Trump, or whatever, you know, stupid thing. 
And you're just like, okay, well, it has nothing to do with the actual sins of anybody else or the fact that we're sinful people. It's your all's fault because you didn't vote for the guy that, or gal that we wanted you to vote for. <laughs> and, but it's the same sort of thing. It's, it's pagans. So, so that's a great example, you know, a very contemporary example of you have a world that's becoming increasingly paganized. And how did these men, who didn't have the advantages of um, having a widespread knowledge, of general widespread knowledge of Christianity, how did they deal with these accusations? And then, so I think it would be, that this would be a whole other study, but to say, what, you know, what are our, you know, what, what are the emerging um, accusations against Christianity? And then which of those specifically correspond to the older ones from the second century, and then which ones are not? But how can we use the second century argumentation against the pagan accusations today then? Uh, and again, just like the apologists, you know, they didn't have great luck. You know, um, however, they made the confession, and that's what we're wow. called to do as well. We're not called, uh, you know, to go out and win a bunch of converts because it's not within our power. That's whole. That's solely up to the Holy Spirit working through the means of grace. But to be able to identify those charges and those arguments and be able to respond to them, you know, for the salvation of men's souls um, and for the confession of Christ and the glory of God. So if there's anything, I hope that's what we've taken away from second century There was so apologists. much bad publicity against um, Mike Lindell or the My Pillow guy. Oh, yeah, My Pillow, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, he got up there and gave testimony. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's oh, what we're seeing. Man, yeah, and that's what we're seeing is we're entering into a new time, or we're entering further into this new season, where our confession of faith to those around us, to our families, you know, as a church, as a congregation, as individuals, that is going to be more necessary than ever. So we pray that God would give us the same tenacity of spirit, uh, the same faithfulness, and also the same um, eloquence, if you will, as he did Justin, the author of you know, the Epistle of Diognetus, and Athenagoras, Tertullian, and these guys, um, you know, to speak as he gives us opportunity. All right, we heard the bell for church, so let us close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. For these great confessors and saints that have gone before us, we pray, Lord, that we would emulate them in our speech and in our writings toward others, that we may be a city shining on a hill, that we may be the salt of the earth, uh, and that we may boldly confess our faith in you, uh, despite the consequences which the world heaps upon us, but that we may in all situations look to Christ Jesus, your Son, and the sweet exchange which he has given to us in his death, which we then hold by faith each day. Keep us in this faith each day, we pray. Amen. All right, let us go into the house of the Lord.